Hey there, Riverlanders and uh, Long Prairie Gray Eaglers. Uh, good to see you. Picking a terrible time to uh, try to make a vid here with the sun going down behind me. Apparently, I just want as many light issues as possible um, as I try to learn how to uh, operate this camera. It is November 30th. We bid farewell to the month of November. Say hello to December, and if you're like me, you're probably kind of looking forward to bidding farewell to the year 2020. And uh, although we are all kind of wondering what 2021 might bring us in the way of magical surprises and horrors, and uh, well, I guess we'll just, it will proclaim itself, uh, won't it? You know, for some of us, it is uh, the beginning of Advent that started yesterday. I know some of you are unbelievers, and that's just great. I'm clapping for everyone. But for many of us, um, it begins a month of waiting. Uh, Advent and Lent, uh, to, to me, just meditorializing, have some things in common. It's about waiting. You're waiting for something to happen. And it's about darkness and cold. And some of us, some of us, a few of us, one or two of you, like me, are waiting for the birth of that little baby. Uh, on December 25th, Christmas Day, and in Advent, in Lent rather, we, we, it's kind of the opposite. We are waiting for his death um, by crucifixion, and uh, I guess we're all just waiting and waiting and, and waiting and waiting. It's just part of, part of the deal. Um, relatively simple vid today, I'd like to put before you a Christmas poem. Um, that I've been running for some, actually quite a few years now. And when I'm picking out a Christmas poem for my precious students, I really only got a couple questions. Is it beautiful? And is it, is it gay enough? Um, and I think Mark Doty's M Messiah Christmas portions uh, is definitely both of those things. I'm just being satirical. Uh, Mark Doty does uh, write a lot of poetry and, do, and memoir. About, the, about gay urban life on the East Coast, on the Atlantic seaboard. That's not my story. Um, but I, I, re I really admire him, and I particularly, in particular, I admire this poem. And you'll also get the dignity of a story if you open up your heart to it. It runs a little bit longer. It's about five minutes, but it's really pretty. Don't go make a sandwich. Um, um, pause it, then make the sandwich, and then come back uh, to the poem. I'm, I'm going to at least reveal a reading game uh, that I ran this, this morning with my two comp ones that are live Zoom, my 9 and my 10 o'clock class. And we'll, we'll get to that soon enough. And I'd also like to uh, give you some preparation for the last thing we're going to read this semester. We have two weeks to go in the semester. Monday, Wednesday, Friday this week, three classes next, and then a week of finals. I'm going to have to double check the Riverland schedule though, so I'm on it. Um, and don't make the kind of mistake I made uh, uh, last week. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, it's pretty uh, consistent across the entire Men's State system. Uh, two weeks of class ahead, roughly. And then we, we have four days of finals at CLC, Monday through Thursday, I believe. I better double check that, too. We're not obligated uh, in you know, face to face classes to have a final, but we are obligated to meet. That's a, uh, pol it's a policy, it's, um, it's, it's a contract thing. Um, I also, uh, there's a bonus little thing here. I don't know if I can drop an MOV file into. Um, Final Cut Pro, but I, I'm going to find out. I'm, I'm still learning about um, editing. But before we do any of this stuff, before I give you a Mark Doty poem, before we run a reading game, and before I uh, talk a little bit about the, the challenges of reading William Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, I, I have a Thanksgiving story, and I've been telling it all day long, and it has to do with uh, uh, serendipity. So that's something that's really interesting to me, the idea of uh, you know, you're trying to read the world. I am. I'm, I'm on an endless search for meaning. And when, when events seem connected, um, th things that you're experiencing in your life, well, that, that's serendipity. And you're kind of going, wow, is that, you know, a little flash of the supernatural or something? Or is that just random? Is that just an accident? Um, I guess I'll leave it up to, to you to decide. So let me have like a prelude. Uh, and we'll, we'll start with a story. I was stacking some wood. I think I've shown you my wood pile. I showed it to my students today. I just tilted the camera because I was in my other uh, my Zoom room. And uh, they went, yeah, that's a pile of wood. But I was stacking wood, which I'm super good at. I mean, I mean I'm like a genius at piling up wood. It just it takes, you know, you got to care about it. You got to stack that wood like it matters. And here's what happened to me. And this is going to happen to you someday. Oh, you're all too young to have this happen now. But when you get older, what's going to happen once in a while 
when you got enough years and decades behind you is once in a while you're going to have a memory that's going to flukishly come to you and you're going to be like, wow, how can I still remember that? Or even more importantly, why haven't I thought of this in so many years? Uh, it's crazy. Um, but I've got to back up based on a text I just got. You know, the day before Thanksgiving Eve, I uh, called my neighbor, Catherine Conner, who lives on the south end of this lake. She's got 77 acres. I called her um, during the day because I realized, um, hey, it's Thanksgiving, it's the pandemic, she's in her 80s. And on top of that, she's outliving her fourth husband, third husband, if you can imagine that. She lost the first one to cancer, the second one to suicide. Guy shot himself twice. I'm not even going to tell you that story ever. It's terrible. And her third husband, Harold, has been uh, in, a, in a memory care unit. And on top of that, he caught COVID. So I, I called her up. She, she, we text once in a while. We're friends. We've been neighbors for 23 years. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I bet that sounded horrible. And she, she'll call me late at night when she's nervous. And I, I always, I'm always here for her. And because uh, you got to be a good neighbor. That's, that's basic country living for you. Country living 101. I called her and I said, would you like me to bring you a Thanksgiving dinner? She wasn't sure. She didn't know if she was going to be with her uh, daughters uh, or not, or, or you know, home uh, alone. They love her well, but we're all trying to stay safe in this totalitarian state that wants none of us to be in relationship with one another. Sorry, I almost got political. So I said, well, let me know. Let me know. If you'd like a meal, I'll I, I deliver. I'll be over there in my half-ton truck early in the afternoon with a Thanksgiving dinner that cannot be beat. And then, um, uh, to get to that memory that is 36 years old, I'm stacking the wood, and all of a sudden, my mind returned in thought to a long-ago Thanksgiving in 1984, when I was a boy, kind of in my lost-in-the-desert phase, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And that year, or at least that fall, I was working as a bartender at a restaurant called Winfield Potter's, which used to be in St. Anthony, Maine. i got to Google that and see if it's still there. Probably not. Probably long gone. I would get fired from that restaurant because the manager didn't like me at all. And she made me, because she didn't like me, she made me work a Thanksgiving day. So I'm in this bar all alone, kind of swanky, feeling sorry for myself, and pouring rain too. And out of that pouring rain, at about 4 o'clock on Thanksgiving afternoon, Again, I'm 24 years old, had a full head of hair, etc. A couple came into that bar that really looked down on their luck. And I took one look at them and I thought, oh no. And the woman sat down and the guy came up to the bar and all he ordered was were two cups of coffee that he tried to pay for with change. I'm talking pennies, okay? And I said, you don't have to. Um, I, look, I got this. The coffee's on me. And they went and sat and looked out at the rain. And I don't remember them talking very much, even though I can no longer summon their faces. Well, it was obvious that they were broke. Um, desolation angels in America, man. America will eat you up. And I'm, I'm just guessing, uh, inferencing, which is part of what today's lesson is about. And I got the idea that they figured out that they should try to observe Thanksgiving in some way. And their decision that they enacted was to go to a really nice restaurant where they could maybe get a couple of cups of coffee and at least smell the food. Well, the good news is um, I, everybody that worked at that restaurant that day got a meal comped, um, which is restaurant talk. And I knew anytime I wanted it, I could have a great big Thanksgiving meal. And so I went back to the chef. The manager didn't like me, but the chef did. We were friends. And I said, okay, look, I want, I, please, I'd like my Thanksgiving dinner now. And would you help me out and just kind of lay it on thick because I want to give this meal to a couple. Uh, at the bar. I want to bring them two plates and, 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 div and divide it. And he just laid it on. I mean, the, the stuffing was coming off the plate. And I took it out to that couple with two plates and silverware. And I said, here, this is, um, I want you to have this meal. Um, you divide it up and um, would you like a couple of beers? And I went to the bar and got them each a tall brown beer. And the gratitude that radiated from their eyes was just really something uh, uh, to see. And I stood on my front porch thinking, why haven't I thought about them in so many years? What happened to them? Are they still together? Have they had better Thanksgivings since then? I, I, who knows? And then on um, Thanksgiving evening, 
I know I'm a long way from literature right now, but sometimes I like to talk about life. Thanksgiving evening, I was out running around doing errands, and I was just pulling into my driveway and I realized, crap, I forgot the cranberries. I wanted to make a cranberry relish, believe it or not, that had fresh ginger and uh, chopped jalapenos. I wanted to spice it up a little bit, mix it out a little bit. And so I headed on, headed on down the road to Richmond. I'm always pointing to the, you know, like, like you care, but anyway, I, I, I think geographically. And I headed to a town that's about eight miles south of me here on County Road 9. And I was going a little bit too fast. And cranking music, classical music makes me drive like a maniac. And it was a Bach a cello a concerto. <laughs> so you know what happened? I looked up after a moment. I was like, holy cow, those are a lot of police lights. It was like a red, white, and blue explosion behind me. And it wasn't a regular squad car. It was like the sheriff's SUV. And it was double sheriff's, right? One on the right side of the car, one on the left. I rolled down the window. The sheriff said, um, do, do you have any idea why we pulled you over? And I said, um, oh, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. I, I said, well, you, I might have been driving, driving too fast. And, and the officer said, do you, have any, do you know how fast you were going? I said, I have no idea. He said, you were doing 74 in a 55. And I thought, whoa, I'm dead. I'm, in, I'm getting a speeding ticket. I can almost always talk my way out of it. And then it was just a comedy of mis errors. He said, do you have your driver's license? I said, you, you know, I've lost my driver's license. What? You're out driving around with, and you've lost your license? No, I, I've lost it in my house during the pandemic, and I'm too afraid to go to the DMV and get it. And he's like, okay, can I see your insurance card? And I go into my glove compartment, and the other sheriff was over there with the flashlight to see if I had anything naughty in that glove compartment. And I didn't, and I, I pulled out a holy card of St. Michael. I said, I got a holy card of St. Michael. He said, he won't help you now. I said, yeah, he will. And I went into the glove compartment, and I found my insurance card. And sure enough, um, it was expired by a couple of years. And I'm like, this is it. I'm going to get a big ticket right now. And they went back, and the radio was squawking. And it was like a Thanksgiving miracle. They came up to me, and they said, you know, Jeff, I think we're going to let you have a good night. For, for, could you get your insurance card in there, or at least get a picture of it on your phone? And um, also, could you use your cruise uh, more when you're going down the highway? That'll prevent you from... Uh, getting uh, going too fast. And I said, thank you so much. It's a Thanksgiving miracle. Thank you for um, th th this, this mercy you've shown me. Well, I couldn't turn around, so I drove up the dirt road a little bit and tried to find another dirt road to turn around on. And then it occurred to me, this is a sign that I'm supposed to pray about that long ago couple from 1984. And I sat there and I prayed a long time. And um, hold on a second. I got to call my son back. I'm sorry, that was super rude. I, I, my big boy, I hear from him every day, but my young boy, Will, we don't get a lot of language from him after he's moved out this year. And when, I'm sorry, when he flickered on the phone, I was like, I, I have to talk to him. I just have to talk to him. We'll leave that on. Where was I? Oh, I decided that I would pray for that couple. And I did. And it doesn't matter what I prayed, but I'm, I want to tell you the minute, the precise, perfect moment, the second that I got done praying for that couple, wherever they are, the phone flickered and it was Catherine Conner across the lake telling me that she would love to have a Thanksgiving meal. And on top of that, her husband, Harold, died this past Monday of COVID and Alzheimer's. And that funeral was today and I couldn't go because I had to do my job and teach. And I brought her a wonderful meal and I'm just trying to, these two meals seem connected somehow. I can't prove it, the meal that I gave that couple from way back and the meal that I brought, uh, Catherine. And I, I hope it's okay that uh, I talked about that. So let's, um, let's take a look at Mark Doty. This is uh, Mark Doty's Messiah Christmas portions. It, it is uh, such a pleasure to stand here with my fellow laborers. So, years ago, I lived in a little town in coastal Massachusetts where one winter our choral society, the local choir, decided to mount a production of Handel's Messiah. And this was a uh, uh, cause for both celebration and, and, and some uh, caution. Uh, we were a very small town. They had very little experience. Um, but, you know, because it's a small town, you go. And uh, as I was walking into the, the church where 
uh, this performance was about to take place, there was this extraordinary sunset. And I thought, well, there's a sure thing. <laughs> or you can go in. <laughs> Messiah, Christmas portions. Oh, and I, I need to, uh, there's one sort of arcane word in the poem, melisma. Uh, people who sing will, will know that word. Melisma is when you take one syllable and you hold it across many notes. So, so when we sing Gloria, that's a melisma, okay? Messiah, Christmas portions. A little heat caught in gleaming rags, in shrouds of veil torn and sunshot swaddlings. Over the Methodist roof, two clouds propose a Zion of their own, blazing colors of tarnish on copper against the steely close of a coastal afternoon, December, while under the steeple, the choral society prepares to perform Messiah pouring in their best blacks and whites onto the raked stage. Not steep, really, but from here, the first pew, their a looming cloud bank of familiar angels, that neighbor who fights operatically with her girlfriend, for one, and the friendly bearded clerk from the post office, tenor trapped in the body of a baritone, Altos from the A&P, soprano from the t-shirt shop. Today, they're all poise, costume and purpose conveying the right note of distance and formality. Silence in the hall, anticipatory, as if we're all about to open a gift we're not sure we'll like. How could they compete with Sunset's oratorio? Thoughts which vanish when the violins begin. Who'd have thought they'd be so good? Every valley proclaims the solo tenor, a sleek blonde I've seen somewhere before. The liquor store shall be exalted. And in his handsome mouth, the word is lifted and opened into more syllables than we could count. Central ah dilated in a Baroque melisma, liquefied. The pour of voice seems to make the unplaned landscape. The text predicts the Lord will heighten and tame. This music demonstrates what it claims. Glory shall be revealed. If art's acceptable evidence, mustn't what lies behind the world be at least as beautiful as the human voice? The tenors lack confidence, and the soloists, half of them anyway, don't have the strength to found the mighty kingdoms these passages propose. But the chorus, all together, equals my burning clouds, and seems itself to burn, commingled powers deeded to a larger, centering claim. These aren't anyone we know. Choiring dissolves familiarity in an uppouring rush which will not rest, will not for a moment be still. Aren't we enlarged by the scale of what we're able to desire? Everything the choir insists might flame. Inside these wrappings burns another brighter life, quickened now by song. Hear how it cascades in overlapping lapidary waves of praise. Still time. Still time to change. I love that man. I just love that man. Kaba Akbar, the Iranian-American poet that I hosted last October, uh, told me that when he saw Mark Doty read at the American Writers Project um, last year, there was one poem that Mark Doty read that I guess just devastated 
the audience, everybody was just bawling, tears rolling down cheeks. And I, I love the idea of that poem, the notion that of a bunch of you know, ordinary people getting ready together to collaboratively do something artistic that, that succeeds. Ordinary people doing something extraordinary. I, 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 how, how, I can't even resist that story. So a couple, couple other things today. Um, I, I want to keep approaching reading issues with you. Um, because my class is more devoted to reading than it is to writing. And, and if you feel ripped off, um, uh, that's fine. And Hope Ring, I loved the, te the email that you sent me. I read it to my students all morning. Um, I should read it to these students, too. Um, and I know that's a breathtaking breach of confidentiality. But um, gosh, that was a nice uh, email to send me. And um, i gotta, I got to remember to answer that. So... Look at this, look at this text. It's not complicated. Person A says, there's a new movie in town Friday. <clears throat> Person B says, oh, that's nice. Not a lot to go on there. And, but I had students today who bid at the game. So I started out at my nine o'clock class with a, kid, a young man named Brandon Crawl, uh, who wears a hoodie and a hat to every single class. And he has no idea that on Wednesday I'm crashing into that live Zoom class wearing my only hoodie with a hat. I want to match. I said, Brandon Crawl, what's going on? Give me a scenario. And he, you know, he kind of worked on it. He's like, well, I think, I think somebody's trying to ask somebody out. I said, okay, where? Where are we? Well, then somebody else had to chime in. This is, a, this is at a restaurant. This is at a bar. Um, and, and, and they played the game. And we can't play it, right? Because this is an interactive. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm making a vid. It's just me talking to you and talking to myself, which is what it feels like sometimes. But um, let me reveal what, what I was up to. I wanted my students today, and I want you to think about the idea of inferencing. Inferencing is not just reading. It's not just following the lines of, of, of prose or poetry as they go back and forth across the page. Inferencing is about digging deeper. It's about going down deep into a text and possibly trying to compass out what might be going on in the white space. Now that might sound like a strange thing, but I'm kind of obsessed with it. Yeah, I want to be a good reader. I want to read everyone definitively. But I'm always looking between the lines. I'm always looking between the words. What's happening there? What's, what is happening in the unsaid, the unwritten, the unexpressed? And I had to tell all my students today, and I'll tell you, that I think it's absolutely important to work on that constantly. And I also want to tell you that that dialogue, there's a new movie in town Friday, oh, that's nice, is something I stole, idea-wise, from one of the greatest English professors in the history of the state of Minnesota. In my Lost in the Desert phase in 1984, when I was getting fired from that restaurant, Winfield Potter's, I was starting to realize, you know what, I need to do something with my life. <clears throat> and I was starting to take graduate English classes at the University of Minnesota. And it was there that I went under for well, two courses, actually, the very substantial wing of uh, Professor Richard Beach, uh, Rick, Rick Beach. And he and I became great friends in a flash, and he let me help him work on a book um, that I don't have. It's like the first book I participated in, uh, in, in, in producing. It was on composition theory. And I, what, I, my, mem my mind is going back to that same year, and I can see it with the same clarity that I can see that couple at the Winfield Potter's Restaurant. Beach put th those two sentences up on the board, graduate level English class. And by the way, un in undergraduate school, everyone's nice. Not in graduate school. That's where the knives come out. It can get mean. And Beach was from the South, so he had this way of like putting stuff up on the board, and then he'd say, what about it? What about it? What's going on? And I'm like, oh, I want to play this game. Person A uh, is a young man. We're in a high school. And two lockers away is a girl. And he wants to ask her out, but he's nervous. And that's what he says. And the young woman, she, she wants to go on a date with him. She's kind of interested. And she says, oh, that's nice, because she wants him to be just a, a trifle bit more assertive, a little bit more uh, engaging, a little braver. 
and um, Beach was just really into what I was saying. He was just like, yes. And when I said this, a, a woman in there who just hated me, I don't know why, kind of like that manager niece at Winfield Potters. If, if I have 100, encounter 100 people, 99 of them like me, and the 100th person comes at me with a bloody ax, well, I don't know why that is. I had a principal say to me long ago, the one that, well, I don't even want to go into that story. But I did. She, one day, a principal long ago in the 90s said, why do people either love or hate you? I said, I don't know. I, I'm happy that most people love me. Um, she tried to fire me too, but I talked my way out of that. So the minute I said, person A is a woman, or is a man, person B is a, is a, is a young girl, this student who disliked me instantly said, Jeff, for all you know, it could be two transvestites. And the class laughed a little bit, and I said, you know, okay, great. Um, that's your reading, that's your inferencing, but what are my odds and what are your probabilities? And then the class laughed hard, er, and she just had an opportunity to hate me any, even more. You've got to be able to inference. It's, it's a crucial reading skill, and I'll, I'll talk about this more as, as we go on. We need to talk about reading theory a little bit more in depth uh, when, we, when I make my next vid. I was going to say reconvene, and it will be a reconvening. Um, for um, Wednesday. Now regarding William Faulkner, uh, the novel As I Lay Dying, I gotta help you understand a couple things before we go up this road. We have, uh, I've got more, another remark to make on plots. We have, in general, two kinds of plots in literature, linear and nonlinear. The, the linear plot is the way my day has gone and the way your day has gone, right? We're bound by time, physicality, and finitude. And we sort of have to do one, one thing after another. So um, to put my routine before you, I know you, we've all got different routines, and I'm 61, barely, and I've got a different routine than you. So today I did what I do every Monday. I got up, I put a log on the stove or two because the wood stove is always going out. Um, I, I had a little coffee. Um, I had some yogurt and walnuts and blueberries. I went running three and a half miles on the farm. I... Uh, uh, got ready, I showered, I flossed my teeth, you know, and I taught all morning. Um, ran to the bank, I mean, just, you know, the, the, the stuff of life, one thing after another. In literature, most plots are like that too. Many plots are linear. You turn the pages and you move through time. But in the beginning of the 20th century, we had some writers uh, begin to conduct grand experiments. Uh, with the forms that storytelling could take. And William Faulkner, our last writer of the semester, was definitely one of those writers. And he is interested in nonlinear plots. A nonlinear plot doesn't flow on a straight, thin line. It comes together, kind of pastiche-wise, as the French would put it, or to put it in a simpler way, like a puzzle. Um, and it's not bound by time, it's not bound by linearity. And if you're a, a linear, sequential person, if you're a math person or a science person, I've seen this for years, those are the kinds of plots that'll drive you nuts. As I Lay Dying is like that. As I Lay Dying is a royal, magnificent mess. And the plot is relatively simple. There's a character, it's about a family, uh, the Bundrens. And their mother, the matriarch, Addie Bundren, you'll discover early in the novel, is dying. She's, she's dying, and, and on top of that, she can sense around her in the farmhouse in Mississippi that they're, they're, everyone's getting ready for her funeral. What would be a big clue about that? Well, she can look out the window that has a breeze flowing through it, and she can see her son Cash across the farmyard in the barn making her coffin. How freaky is that? He's making her coffin while, while she's dying. He's working on the lid. And here's the thing. We don't just have one storyteller like we did with The Great Gatsby. That was Nick Carraway, one man talking to you. That novel would have been different had Jay Gatsby told it, had Tom uh, Buchanan or Daisy told it, had Myra Wolfsheim to told it. You just have Nick's viewpoint, no other. Everything is about perspective in life and in literature. And the deal with this novel is you don't have one narrator, you have 16. And even though the main character dies in like chapter two or three, she remains the main character, and as you turn the chapters, different people come forward to tell different stories about their relationship with Addie. Her children come forth. Jewel, and Vardaman, and Darl, and Dewey Dell. 
uh, Cash come forward. Ants comes forward, her husband. A-N-S-E is his name. Neighbors come forth and tell their stories. And I don't want to wreck anything too much, but Addie has had more than one lover, and they come forth and, 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 and tell the story too. It, the novel was written in six and a half weeks. I'll talk more about that on uh, Wednesday. Read about half of it this week, half of it next, and then uh, we will end uh, this little class not reading, but watching one of the great plays, greatest plays ever produced by an American, a Lost Generation writer named uh, Thornton uh, Wilder. Now, I'm near the end of this vid. Oh, I got to breach confidentiality. Hope, I hope I'm not in trouble with you for what I'm about to do. But it's too late, Hope. You can't stop me, okay? Because you're down there, and I'm trapped in a badly made video. And um, here, Hope Rain in this class sent me this email. This is the fastest way to get in trouble. As an, as an English teacher in the men's state system. If you breach confidentiality, you can get fired. So if you want to get me in trouble right now, send this video to my dean. Um, but you sh I'm pretty unsupervised right now, so she'll just yell at me in a Zoom meeting. Like if you're a PSEO student, you must know this. You've got confidentiality. You've got a right to that. Like if a parent calls me and says, how's my student doing? If I tell him, even if I say he's doing great or she's doing great, um, uh, whoa, is it a fast way to, uh, to get fired? Um, and um, so here we go. This is illegal, what I'm about to do. Hope sent me this this morning and says, so I like giving my favorite teachers Christmas gifts, but with COVID and stuff, I can't deliver them in person. So I was wondering if you would be willing to give me your address so I could send you one. If, that's, if not, that's fine. I was just wondering. Hope rang. You want my address, Hope, to give me a present? Hell yeah. And I'm going to call an audible right now, and I don't even need to post this up in D2L because you can just replay the vid. Hope, I'm Jeff Johnson at 18967, 303rd Street, Avon, Minnesota, 56310. Don't hold back, you guys, with the cash, the coupons, and, 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 and the presents. Don't be shy. It's not against Men's State policy, uh, uh, quite unlike what I just did. No. I, I ran a vid. I forgot to show my 10 o'clock classes this, this morning, which means I've, I've got to um, uh, remember to give it to them on Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Here's a, just a little clip um, that will prove to you that you know, things break down as you get older. This is the greatest right, one of the greatest writers Mexico has ever produced, Carlos Fuentes. And if the MOV file doesn't drop into my storyline on Final Cut Pro, we will just cut to the quote that Severus Skywalker is just like completely addicted to. And I, I'm not going to reveal uh, the identity of Severus Skywalker, but um, that's also a student in, in this course that um, I'm enjoying so much in spite of the remoteness and the weirdness of this year. Uh, I'll get this edited and I'll get it uploaded over at St. John's and, and get you your video on Monday. God bless you all. I write with uh, one finger only. I used to write with two fingers, but look what happened to the other finger. Uh, after having written thousands and thousands of pages, uh, this went the way of all fingers, maybe, and uh, the, lig the, the ligament is destroyed. The, uh, the bone is in bad shape. Uh, the, the, the finger is totally crooked. I can't use it anymore. Uh, it, it's f painful. Um, and the only solution is to have some metal put in here so it looks straight, it'll look nice. But I won't be able to do anything with it, so why not keep this uh, memento of, uh, of my writing career? Um, I don't mean to say that I want a finger to be sticking up in my grave indicating who I was, but uh, the uh, other finger is going also the same way. And when it's uh, also destroyed, and then maybe I'll just have to close my typewriter and resort to smoke signals, I guess.